Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmin. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bilhikma. Ul ma'afid al-hasna. Vajad zimrati ahsan. Rabbi shalli sadri. Wassilli amri. Wahalul uqdatan min lisani hafka wa kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, and the Peace TV Chinese, as well as my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and the Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome all of you to the program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. We just finished the first part of the session, that's by Farik, and I thank him for handling the question answer session of the first part. And now we proceed to the second part of the question answer session. Do it now. <clears throat> In this session, you're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed and you're unable to reply or any question that you find on the media which is derogatory to Islam. This is the opportunity. You can ask your question in brief on any of the four social media platforms but the best is to ask as a text message on the WhatsApp by mentioning your question in brief along with your name and profession and the city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat plus six zero double one Two six nine five three eight nine five. Before we throw the floor open for the question and answer session, I would like to give you two important messages. <clears throat> the first message is that Alhamdulillah, ten days ago. On the 21st of October 2020, mashallah, Peace TV English and Peace TV Urdu in the Asia region and Asia Pacific region has restarted its HD telecast. The SD is continuing since long. And Alhamdulillah, we have also started the Peace TV Bangla my telecast on the Intersat 20. As you may be aware, that Alhamdulillah, the Peace TV Network launched its first channel, the Peace TV English, in January 2006. And now, inshallah, within two years, we'll be complete. Inshallah, in two months' time, we'll be completing 15 years of its telecast. And later on, we launched in June 2009. Peace TV Urdu, which is Alhamdulillah at present 11 and a half years old. Then we launched in April 2011 Peace TV Bangla, which is nine and a half years old. And Peace TV Chinese, we launched in October 2015, which is now five years old. And Alhamdulillah. In June, to, in June 2009, Peace TV English was the first religious satellite channel to telecast its channel in HD. The first religious HD channel in the world on the satellite, Alhamdulillah, was Peace TV English, which was launched in the North American region. It covered part of South America also, Alhamdulillah. And at that time in 2009, 
HD wasn't popular. It was popular on a small percentage in North America. And later on, in December 2009, the second channel, which was religious, on HD was TBC, that is the Trinity Broadcasting Corporation, that is the Christian channel. And Alhamdulillah, in 2014, we started telecasting Peace TV English in HD, even in the Middle East. And in 2015, we started telecasting Peace TV HD English and Peace TV Urdu HD in the Asia Pacific region on the Asia Sat 7. And at that time also, the HD wasn't very popular. Hardly about 10% of the people in India, Pakistan, in the Indian subcontinent had HD. Later on in 2017, after more than about two years, we had to discontinue for a certain time. And then Alhamdulillah, now 10 days ago, we have restarted in the Asia Pacific region. Alhamdulillah, on the interest at 20. At present, Peach TV English, Peach TV Urdu and Peach TV Bangla, all three are on HD on the interest at 20. And in the Middle East, on Arab side, it is continuing since 2014, Alhamdulillah. And Alhamdulillah, at present, Peace TV English is on Intersat 20 on 10 Mbps, Alhamdulillah. In most of the Islamic channels, they are hardly 3 Mbps, 2 Mbps, some are even 1 Mbps, which is very low. Alhamdulillah, Peace TV English is on 10 Mbps. And Peace TV Urdu is 8.5 Mbps. And Peach TV Bangla is 6 Mbps, Alhamdulillah. So at present, Alhamdulillah, all the English and the Urdu telecasts that we have in Asia and the Middle East and Africa and Australia have been upgraded to, mashallah, HD telecast. And another good news is that, inshallah, after two days from the 2nd of November, 2020, Peace TV English HD and Peace TV Urdu HD will also be starting on PAKSAT. The Pakistan satellite is very famous in Pakistan and there we have a large percentage of Muslims speaking Urdu language and they also speak English. So we decided to telecast the Peace TV English in HD as well as Peace TV Urdu in HD on PAKSAT, which will inshallah start day after tomorrow from 2nd of November 2020. The second message that I want to deliver before we throw the floor open for the open question and session is the 12 actions to be taken by the Muslim Ummah when someone insults a beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him or someone indulges in Islamic blasphemy. I will not be repeating what I spoke last week, last Saturday, in the last session about what was done in France, including the act of President Emmanuel Macron of France. I will not be repeating that. And I'd given a short message of 24 minutes last Saturday. In that message, I did say that what, Pro, what President Emmanuel Macron said, that Islam is in crisis all over the world, he got it wrong. It is actually Islam has the solution for the crisis all over the world. And I requested that if you hear my talk, Islam, the solution for the problems of humanity, it will clarify all its questions. And even my talk on is terrorism a Muslim monopoly, it will reply to the allegations of 
President Macron that Islam is a radical religion and Islam is a religion of terrorism, it will give the details. I also mentioned in the last session that in regarding what Muslims should do, they should listen to my answer which I gave in 2006 regarding the Danish cartoons. The Jolland Posten newspaper in Denmark which had given caricatures, 12 cartoons of a beloved Prophet Muhammad But because I got so many requests from the viewers that I should repeat the reply and but natural since that reply was in 2006, that's about nine years ago. Today I thought of giving a short message on the 12 actions to be taken by the Muslim Ummah when someone insults a beloved Prophet Muhammad or someone indulges in Islamic blasphemy. If someone speaks against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against the Quran, against Islam. So this answer is a brief regarding the 12 actions that the Muslim should take. It's not only focused or localized to what's happening in France. It includes that, but this is a general answer on 12 points that the Muslim should take. The 12 actions that the Muslim should take. This answer of mine will just be touching on the highlights of these 12 points. I will not be going into the details because this is a question answer session. Each action or each point in detail can be spoken for an hour or more. It requires a lecture. So this I'll be just touching the salient features of these 12 actions that Muslims should take and it will be specifically dealing on this topic. I will not be discussing about the general faraiz that all Muslims should do, that we Muslims should be good examples to the non-Muslims, that we should be honest, we should be kind, we should be merciful, we should be humble, we should be helping. All this is spoken by me in detail in other various lectures of mine. So today I will be hitting the nail on the head, only speaking specifically of the 12 actions that the Muslims Ummah should take when someone insults the Prophet or someone indulges in Islamic blasphemy. The first action, whenever someone reads any article against the Prophet or sees a sketch or a cartoon insulting a beloved Prophet we should follow the hadith of the Prophet a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 177, that a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that if you see any evil action, you should change it with your hand. That means you take an action against it. If you cannot, then do it with your tongue. That is by speaking. If you cannot, then do it with your heart. That means hate that act and agree it is wrong. Then you will be the lowest level of moment, the lowest level of a believer. So the least a Muslim can do, whenever he hears any derogatory remarks against the Prophet or any caricature or any cartoon against the Prophet, any insult against the Prophet, any blasphemy against Islam, the least he can do is condemn it immediately in his heart and agree that what is done is wrong. This is the least anyone can do. Today, after the society has advanced, we find many Muslims have got so much westernized and have started agreeing with the freedom of expression that many a times when someone insults the Prophet, you don't even bat an eyelid. As though nothing has happened. Oh, this is freedom of speech. Today's world is, you know, it's a global village. And the freedom of speech, that someone wants to insult the Prophet, no problem. A moment, a true moment, whenever he hears any insults, the least he can do is condemn that act in his heart. So number one that any Muslim should do whenever he comes across 
any blasphemy against Islam, any insult against the Prophet is condemn that act and agree it is wrong. Then only can you go ahead with the other steps. If you don't condemn it, if you don't hate that thing in your heart, if you don't agree it is wrong, then how will you be able to reply or to take the other steps? So number one is you have to condemn that act in your heart. <clears throat> Number two, he should take some action. Minimum. The minimum today that a Muslim can do in regarding besides condemning that is that tell to convey to the others that this act is wrong. And today the world is a global village. And today the social media has become so popular and so common that for us to condemn such acts we can easily do it on the social media. This wasn't there 10 years back. But now, today, internet is used by about 60% of the world population. Out of the 7.82 billion people that we have today, 60% use internet. 4.56 billion people. And from this, 4.14 billion of the people in the world, they use social media. That is 53% of the world population uses social media. So what a Muslim can do? And most of the Muslims will be having social media accounts. Whether it be Facebook, whether it be YouTube, whether it be Twitter. We have to condemn this act on the social media. If you cannot write any articles yourself or you are not good with words. The least you can do is go to the other Facebook pages or the other social media sites and scan what the other Muslim da'is have said, what the Muslim leaders have said, what other Muslim scholars have said. The least you can do is copy and post it onto your social media account. Today, Facebook is the largest and the most used social media. Today, as on October 2020, there are 2.701 billion users, monthly active users, MAU, in the world. 2.701 billion active monthly users. That's about 35% of the world population. They are on the Facebook. Even if you agree that the Muslims use social media less, at least 25% of the Muslims be on the Facebook. And today, the Muslim population is approximately 2 billion. I'm shocked that in the last one week, when I heard some of the heads of states of Muslim countries, they are saying that Muslims are 1.6 billion in the world today. Some said 1.5 billion. From where do they get these statistics? This may be 10, 15 years back. According to the PEW report, which is authentic report, in 2015, five years ago, they said that Muslims were 1.8 billion. 24.1% of the world population were Muslims. And statistics tell us that the Muslims increase 2.2% annually every year. Some statistics say they increase by 1.5%. If you, if you calculate and you multiply 1.8 billion by 2.2 by 2.2 by 2.25 times, you get a figure of more than 2 billion. If you agree the increase only 1.5% every year, yet you get a figure of 1.95 billion. So today Muslims are 
approximately 2 billion in the world. So how can a head of state of a Muslim country, which is one of the largest in the world, say that Muslims are only 1.6 billion? So even if we agree that 25% of the Muslims use Facebook, that means half a billion Muslims will be having Facebook. And imagine if we convey this message and we condemn this act, it may be anything, whether it may be the Danish cartoon, whether it be the Charlie Hebdo, whether it be Macron, what he insulted the Prophet, or whether it be Salman Rajdi. Whenever such incidents takes place, the least you can do today is on the social media you can wait. And Alhamdulillah, I did a campaign for about five days on the Facebook. And it's going to end today, inshallah, from last Tuesday to the Saturday for five days. And I had 19 posts that were designed. And every day, either three, four or five posts were posted on my Facebook. And Alhamdulillah, in a span of these five days, it's yet continuing. About 35 million people saw this post. Mashallah. And in the next one week, it may reach about 45 to 50 million. So everyone can put on his Facebook. We know today that Facebook, the number of people that you have, the more number of people that you have, the Facebook doesn't let your post reach everyone. They let only a small percentage reach amongst your followers only a small percentage receive unless you pay a lot of money and as a policy I did not I do not give a single dollar I don't give any paid ads or any paid post mine is 100% fully organic my followers alhamdulillah on the Facebook are 22.6 million but on a normal post about 500 500,000 800,000 sometimes a million but in this, mashallah, the average was much higher. You can even post it on Twitter. You can post your condemnation on, on the YouTube. The talk that I gave, the answer that I gave last week, it was for 24 minutes. And when I put on my Facebook, in three days, mashallah, more than half a million people saw it. So in this way, a Muslim can, mashallah, reach across the world. Imagine if all the Muslims put on their social media account, surely we will be able to convey this message to half the world. Everyone at least has some following. And many people have this philosophy that, oh, you know, there are hardly about a thousand people on my Facebook, only 500 people on the Facebook. Allah will give you thawab on your action. Suppose a person can reach a million people and he only reaches half a million people. And a person who Allah has given capacity to reach to a thousand people and he reaches all thousand people, he will get more thawab than the person who has reached half a million people because Allah gave him a capacity of one million. So depending upon whatever ability you have got, my request to the Muslim Ummah is that see to it that you condemn this act on all the social media accounts that you have, whether it be Facebook, whether it be YouTube, whether it be Twitter, whether it be WhatsApp. And today we know, Alhamdulillah, after Facebook, the number two most popular social media account it is the YouTube. YouTube has got 2 billion followers as of October 2020. The third is WhatsApp, which has got 2 billion monthly active users. The fourth is the WhatsApp Messenger, which has got 1.3 billion monthly active users. The fifth it is the WeChat, 1.206 billion monthly active users. The sixth it is the Instagram, 1.1 Five, three billion active users monthly. So if we make use of the more active or the more popular of the social media, there are 
higher chances that you'll reach a larger audience. At least if we take care of the top 15 or the top 20 most active social media, you'll be able to reach a large audience. Snapchat has got 441 million users. Pinterest has got 413 monthly active users. Twitter has got 336 million monthly active users. So what we should do, we should propagate as much as possible on the social media with whatever ability you have. If you cannot do it yourself, copy the post of other Islamic scholars, other Islamic dais, other Islamic leaders and promote this as much as you can. Number three is that you should make a list of the most important people you know and convey this message to them personally. Everyone has some important people that they know. Some people who are celebrities, maybe knowing ministers, maybe knowing other people. Even a normal man living in an apartment, at least he knows the chairman of a society. So what you should do, you should make a list of the top important people that you know who are opinion makers and convey to them this message personally one to one. That has a great impact. And when this issue of the French President Macron came up, I used whatever I could on my social media. Then my wife told me that why don't you convey a message personally to the politicians that you know. And I was quite reluctant saying that you know, most of the politicians will not really take action on it. But my wife said, you should do your duty, leave the rest to Allah. So I went on my mobile, in my contacts, and just typed ministers and mashallah. There were plenty, there were a few hundred, you know, 30 from one Muslim country, 25 from the other Muslim country, 20 from this country, some are prime ministers, some are home ministers, some are Islamic ministers. And I gave a personalized message, depending upon the person, and I spent a couple of hours on it. And Alhamdulillah, the result was phenomenal. I never expected such a good result that many of them replied back. Some took action in the next few hours. Some took action after a day. Some took action after two days. And they sent me their response, Alhamdulillah. Some wrote directly to the, to the embassy. Some wrote letters on the, on the Facebook on the Twitter and Alhamdulillah it had a great impact. So if every Muslim notes down the important people who they know, it's most important that they know. They may be a local MLA, he may be a member of parliament, he may be a minister or he may be just a chairman of your society. The top people that you know, if you give a personalized message, it has an impact because sometimes you require the Muslims to be awakened. And I've never done this earlier. Yes, I did contact a few ministers many a time, but not at such a large level. And Alhamdulillah, it had a great impact. And many of them replied to me back personally. So the third point that should be done is every Muslim, whoever he feels are the most important people he knows. There may be 10, there may be 20, there may be 50, there may be 100. You give them a personalized message, whether a phone call, whether a, whether a personal SMS, whether a personal message on the WhatsApp, talking about this issue, about this blasphemy, and what action should be taken. And believe me, Alhamdulillah, they will be a great impact. The fourth action that can be taken is that Muslims should take out a protest, a peaceful protest against the blasphemy or against the act that has been done. But we should make it a point 
that the protests should be peaceful. We should not use any violence. We should not damage any property. We should not do vandalization. It should be a peaceful protest. And larger the numbers, the better it is. And we know that there were large numbers that have in protests have taken place in the past in various acts of blasphemy done in the past, whether it be Salman Rushdie, whether it be Danish cartoon, and now also, just a few days back, mashallah, people did take out last, large processions in countries like, uh, like Bangladesh, there were more than 40,000 people. Larger the procession, the better it is. It should be a peaceful procession and, it, and there should be a letter drafted depending upon what the act that is done wrong. In this case, it can be to the French embassy or the French consulate in that city. A letter should be given to the consul general or to the ambassador that we disagree what the president of France has said against Islam, against our beloved Prophet Muhammad There should be a letter of condemnation. These processions that are there, it has an impact. The larger the procession, the better it is. And whenever such processions are called for, we Muslims should take part, but see to it that it is a peaceful protest. Because larger the audience that you have, the public that gathers, the larger will the media portray it. It will have a, bit, it will have a better impact on the people. The fifth action that a Muslim can take is that if that act is such that it is promoted by a particular country like the act what happened in the beginning of this month was by France by President Macron then the Muslims can call for a boycott of the products of that country and in this case we could see mashallah that many Muslim countries mashallah they called for the boycott of the French products, of French goods and services. And Alhamdulillah, Inshallah, it will have a great impact on France. And in this campaign on the Facebook that I did on my Facebook, I made five posts last Wednesday, about three days ago mentioning that we should boycott the products of France and the services. And since I could see that most of the posters that spoke about boycotting the goods, the products weren't mentioned in detail and the brands weren't seen clearly. So I decided to select the 100 most famous brands of France starting from Louis Vuitton, Chanel, Hermes and so on and so forth, total. And the first post I gave the top 10 brands of France. The, the second post, the top 11 to 25 brands of France. The third post, the top 26 to 50 brands from France. And the fourth post, the top 51 to 75 brands of France and the fifth post top 76 to 100. So I divided it so that the brands could be seen clearly and Alhamdulillah the response was phenomenal. In the first four posts that I gave on the same day, the least it reached in a span of three days was four and a half million people mashallah and the highest post was mashallah more than 7 million normally on my facebook as i told you though there are 22.6 million followers normally when i give a post it reaches about 500,000 people 800,000 people if it's more popular 1 million sometimes 2 million but mashallah this time though all the posts were similar one post reached more than 7 million in a span of less than 3 days I checked today, before it reached three days, mashallah, 
seven million people read that message. And the lowest among the four posts was four and a half million people. So all these four posts put together, 22 million people, mashallah, read this post. Imagine 22 million people just give a post. That means average each post was viewed by five and a half million people. As I said, that when a campaign is done, we should see to it that we don't leave all our activities. I decided to do this campaign on my Facebook for five days only because I've been involved in other Dawa activities. We should not stop all other activities and all of us are concentrating on this for months together. Yes, we have to take out some time, maybe five days, six days, one week, and then continue with activities. And there should be others who carry forward, which I will discuss later in my 11th point. So banning the products has a great impact. And when this was done in 2006, in relation to the Danish cartoons done by the, again, the prophet, when there were 12 cartoons that were printed in the, in the Danish newspaper, Alhamdulillah, according to estimate, they went in a loss of somewhere close to $2 billion. And it has a great impact. This is the fifth point. I am putting the points in the order that a common man can do and then going to those points which is difficult for everyone to do. So as far as the first five points are concerned, almost all the Muslims can get involved. Number one, condemning and agree the act is wrong. Number two, using the social media to spread it as much as they can. Number three, pointing out this issue to the important people who they think are public opinion makers. Number four is taking out a peaceful protest procession. Number five is banning the product of that country if it involves. Depending upon the blasphemy and who has done it, these 12 points will keep on differing. Point number six or action number six is that we should see to it that we use the mainstream media to convey our condemnation for this act of blasphemy, whether it be in the newspapers, whether it be in the magazine, whether it be on the satellite channel. Everyone cannot involve giving articles in the magazine or the newspaper or the satellite. So whoever Allah has given the skill of writing, they should use their skill to write letters or write articles in the newspapers, in the magazines, or maybe give an interview on the channel, in the news channel, or give a talk. We should use the mainstream media as much as possible. And those Muslims who own the mainstream media should see to it that we convey this message of protest on the mainstream media, whether it be newspapers, whether it be magazines, whether whether it be radio broadcast stations, whether it be satellite channels, we convey this message as much as we can so that this message goes throughout the world. Action number seven is that we should try and file a legal case against this blasphemy. If someone insulted the Prophet or someone has done some blasphemous act against Islam, we should have a team or a battery of lawyers. A team of lawyers who will know that how this can be filed in the court of law. Depending upon the action that has taken place, depending upon the insult that has been hurled on our beloved prophet, we should see to it that we file a case in the appropriate court of law. And we know that during Danish cartoons, there were Muslim lawyers who filed a case in January 2006. This incident took place on the 30th of September 2005. And initially, when the ambassador of the Muslim country went to the Danish authorities, government, they didn't give much importance to it. Then the Muslim filed a case in the court of law 
but unfortunately they said it is permitted in the freedom of expression to make such cartoons which is absurd how can blasphemy be permitted in the name of freedom of expression and the same thing was said the same thing was said by president macron he said that blasphemy is permitted in the freedom of expression can you believe blasphemy if he says that he is the biggest hypocrite just a few days before when president erdogan said that president macron requires a mental checkup because he gave derogatory remarks against the prophet against islam so president of turkey president erdogan mentioned that president macron requires a mental checkup immediately he called the envoy to turkey back he called the french ambassador of turkey back to the country just by saying that macron requires a mental checkup he is calling his ambassador back and you are abusing the prophet and that's allowed in freedom of expression so isn't it double standard what we should do is we should file a legal case have good lawyers who are well versed with the law it may be in the international court of law or it can be in the court of that country based on the act number 8 is that the muslim countries if such an act like what has happened recently takes place the muslim countries should call the ambassador of that country which has done this act and convey the message of condemnation or give them a warning and alhamdulillah this has been done very well in many of the muslim countries not all many is wrong it should be few Alhamdulillah when president Macron gave the statement against Islam there were some muslim countries who called the ambassador we know that it happened in turkey it happened in malaysia mashallah it happened also in pakistan but it didn't happen in all the muslim countries all the muslim countries should at least call the ambassador of that country which had done this act and convey our condemnation of this act that we disagree with this blasphemy we disagree that a prophet has been insulted imagine if the head of that country was insulted by any other foreign country will the foreign minister keep quiet and the answer is no imagine if some caricature of the prime minister or the president or the king of that country is made in a foreign country and put up on buildings immediately the same day there will be a protest so imagine when the head of state if someone pokes fun at him you want to make a protest why don't we do it when someone makes fun of the prophet knows billah if you don't protest when someone makes fun of the head of state it is accepted yet you are a muslim but how can you agree that a prophet is being insulted and you are keeping quiet our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 1 hadith number 15 that the prophet said that a person is not a believer until he loves me more than his father and more than his children and more than whole human kind the prophet said a person is not a believer a person is not a muslim unless he loves the prophet more than the father more than his children more than whole of human kind abla the prophet said it is mentioned in sahih bukhari point number 1 hadith number 16 that there are three qualities in which a, if a person has the three qualities if a person has he will taste the sweetness of faith number 1 is love allah and his messenger more than anything else in the world number 2 if a person loves a person and 
if a person loves a person for the sake of Allah and he loves him for the sake of Allah. Number three is that he wouldn't like to go in disbelief, like he wouldn't like to go into the hellfire. If anyone has these three criteria, he has tasted the sweetness of faith. That means it is compulsory for every Muslim, every moment to love Allah and his messenger more than anything else in this world. So how can we not take objection when someone inserts a prophet, when someone does any Islamic blasphemy? The eighth is that The eighth action that can be taken is that we can, if depending upon the seriousness, all these points I'm mentioning is that some, sometimes someone writes a small article, then maybe the first three points are sufficient. You may not have to go to the fourth point or the fifth point. Depending upon the blasphemy, depending upon the seri seriousness of an act, you may have to do only first two points, sometimes three points, sometimes five, sometimes eight, sometimes more. The ninth action that can be taken is that we can stop trade. The Muslim country can stop trade with that country which has done this blasphemy. Depending upon if the head of state or if that country promotes this blasphemy or condones this blasphemy, then such action should be taken. If there is an individual in the country doing some blasphemy, and if the country doesn't condone it, then you need not go to these levels of number 7, 8 or 9. But like what happened in France, the president of France, he is condoning it and he goes out of the way to put the caricatures on tall government buildings printed in the mainstream media. These blasphemous acts in the name of freedom of expression. The ninth action that can be taken is that we can stop trade with that country. And we know that Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Muslim countries some important, important products. And number one, it is the oil, it is the petrol. We know that most of the petrol, most of the oil in the world is alhamdulillah in comes from the Muslim countries. If these countries make a pack or a group, the countries that supply petrol all over the world, whether it be Saudi Arabia, whether, whether it be Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, whether it be Malaysia, uh, whether, uh, it, whether it be Nigeria, these countries which have a large export of petrol and if they combine and block and see to it that those countries which are indulging in insulting the Prophet or involving in Islamic blasphemy if they put a trade sanction on them, Alhamdulillah. We see that America, if they want to bully anyone, they can put trade sanctions. Why can't we Muslims? And we Muslims are a big economy. As I said, that today, more than 25% of the world population are Muslims. Imagine the amount of products that we use, the amount of products that we produce, both. So, if we have a trade sanction on a higher level, if the blasphemy is very high or if they don't listen, the ninth action that can be taken is a trade sanction. We know 
in such time there may be certain loss if there is a trade sanction then there may be certain countries which are using a product if we Muslims see to it that all the Muslims countries support each other like as I mentioned where it came to petrol these countries hold the major portion of the world's petrol whether it be Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, Malaysia, Nigeria where it comes to natural gas number one is Qatar where it comes to palm oil majority is Indonesia and Malaysia 60% of the export of the palm oil is from Malaysia 60% of the world export of palm oil it is from Indonesia and 30% is from Malaysia both put together in these two countries have 90% of the export of the palm oil imagine if they work together these two Muslim countries and if any country tries to twist the arm they get together they can very well get an impact fine if certain countries don't purchase from you you may, get, you may go in loss a little bit but imagine the impact that it will have and if you cannot do this for Allah and his Rasul then how can you call yourself Muslims and the tenth action that can be taken is complete boycott and breaking of relationship with that country and that example is like Israel what Israel did to the Muslims in Palestine there were many Muslim countries mashal even till today they have boycotted relationship with Israel many of the Arab countries unfortunately unfortunately in the last few months there are some Arab countries who have again started the relationship if we Muslims are together as Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 2 that help each other in bir and taqwa in righteousness and in good work we Muslims should help each other in righteousness and in good work in piety if we are together and block we can be a formidable force depending upon the act we know that what Israel has done against the Muslims is one of the maximum any country has done against that is the reason we have gone to the level number 10 we have broken all all foreign relationship many countries mashallah and it has had a great impact so we should see to it that we support our Muslim brothers in different parts of the world the 11th is that whenever such issues take place in the Ummah we find many people who take active part Alhamdulillah but we have to realize that this is a specialized work Muslims should collaborate but we should not spend our complete time only doing this and leaving the other activities for example if I am in Dawah organization now what I do for the next six months I stop my Dawah activity and only concentrate on this then it will be a great loss for the Ummah so what we require we require specialized Muslims organization for organizing these things or rather we would like to say organizations for firefighting and these organizations should be specialized in taking care of such issue like someone insults the prophet or someone does Islamic blasphemy these organizations should mainly cater to this they should write from the starting use the social media should be able to see to it that our programs go on air on the satellite on the newspapers as articles whether they have a protest whether they organize boycotts of the products of that country so these organizations who are specialized in dealing with anyone who has insulted the prophet or anyone indulging in Islamic blasphemy is very important like when we have our conference you know we have the peace conference which is one of the largest Islamic English conference in the world where we have more than a million people coming over a span of 10 days in this 
we have approximately more than 4,000 volunteers. And we have about 30 to 40 different groups. We have different 30 to 40 different committees, whether it be hospitality committee, whether it be transportation committee, whether it be food committee, whether it be toilet committee, many committees. And one we have, which is called as firefighting. This firefighting has a separate head altogether, but when required, it has the heads of the other committees also joining. So similarly, we should have specialized organization who are specialized in dealing with how to handle such situation. And these organizations should have maybe a few cyber troopers, depending upon the organization, should have few lawyers. These cyber troopers should know what's, what is trending in the social media, how do they utilize it and how do they convey the message. They should have few lawyers. Now these lawyers may not be high-end lawyers, they may have medium level lawyers, like anyone who insults the prophet or anyone who attacks any other dai. There should be legal action taken. So such organization should be there in most of the Muslim cities. Most of the cities which have majority Muslim, they should be there or should be in the cities where Muslim land minority, but then large numbers. So these organizations, the main aim is to handle this throughout the year. So in such issues as President Macron takes place, all the Muslim Ummah joint, some may join for five days, some may join for six days, some may join for a week, for two weeks. But you can't expect the Muslim Ummah to leave all the activities and full year be after this issue. That will be a loss. Imagine someone is doing dawah, someone is doing some, some teaching, someone doing Islamic teaching. If you stop all these activities for one year and every year there are some issues. So at this time, all should get together for a few days or for a week. But there are organizations who should handle this situation. And they should be able to see to it that they take the impact to the highest level. And in this organization, they should have contacts as volunteers, top lawyers, top politicians, top Muslim leaders. They will come when required, but they should have full time few cyber troopers, full time few lawyers, and they should coordinate and see to it that the end result is achieved. And the twelfth point is that on a higher level, all the Muslim countries should unite and they should have a block. I know that there are certain organizations which are there, but I believe they have become inactive. This collaboration of the Muslim countries together, there are today 56 to 57 countries in the world which have majority Muslims. We should all join together so that if any action is taken, if we take it unitedly, we'll have a bigger impact. And I believe that this should be away from the normal politics. What has happened now that there are certain organizations, but they're more involved in whether will it benefit my country or not if I take objection, will it, will it benefit the leader of the country. They are more bothered about the personal benefit of the country than the benefit of Islam. That's the reason. Unless a person loves the Prophet more than he loves himself, loves his father, loves his children, loves the humankind, he is not a true believer. So we should have, and if we realize that there are certain countries which are, it's not necessary all 57 countries should be together. Let's start with five countries. It will become six, it will become 10, it will become 15. Let them come together and end block on them rather than individually. In such cases, if we come unitedly, we are a bigger force. And in this way, we can, if there is a boycott of products or a trade sanction or helping each other, if the countries are united, the Muslim countries, we are a bigger force. And imagine 25%, more than 25% of the world population are Muslims. If we unite, we can do wonders. And 
I would like to give you a small example. <clears throat> what is the impact? I want to give you an example in history. What is the impact when Muslims are united? We know that the 34th Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, his name was Sultan Abdul Hamid II. He was the last Sultan which actually had powers. He was the third last Sultan. There were two Sultans after that. But the person who had some power and say after that it kept on deteriorating. He was the third last Sultan. But the last Sultan which actually had powers. And we know that he ruled from 1876 to 1909. In his reign, towards the end of the 19th century, in late 1800, there was a comedy play that was supposed to be held in France. On a beloved Prophet It was a satire, a comedy play, insulting a prophet. And when Sultan Abdul Hamid II heard about this, he got very angry and he wrote a strong letter to the French government saying that this is not tolerated by the Muslims and you should not let this play take place and I am totally against it. Initially, the French government tried to give excuses, but they realized that the Sultan was serious. And what did they do? They immediately did not allow this play to take place. And they completely abolished the comedy play to the extent that most of the actors and the people involved, they exiled them to UK to please the Sultan. Few years later, again, news came that the same play is going to take place in UK. So again, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, he got angry and he wrote a similar letter to the UK government that we have heard that there is a play which is which criticizing the Prophet and this is not tolerated in Islam and you should immediately see to it that this play doesn't take place. The UK government, the British government replies, uh, when Sultan said that this was happening few years in France and now it's coming in UK, it should not happen and they stopped it, you should stop it too. The UK government replies saying, UK is not France and we believe in freedom of speech, indicating that they will continue with the play. Sultan Abdul Hamid gets very angry. And he writes a second letter. He says, you may not be aware that my ancestors, they gave their life for the cause of Islam. And I am prepared to do the same. If you do not stop this play, see to it, it is not done. I will inform the full Muslim world that you are doing a play against the Prophet. And you will be held responsible for the consequences. Then the British government realized that the Sultan was serious and they were so much afraid of the Muslim unity that time that they immediately banned the play. Imagine one Sultan says that because that time if you know it was the end of the Ottoman Empire. That means the last it wasn't that powerful at all. Yet just because the Sultan gave a warning I'll inform the full Muslim world that are doing a play which is against the Prophet and you will be held responsible for the consequences. That letter was sufficient to bring shivers in the full government. Imagine, at that time, end of the 19th century, you know, the UK government, the France government, they were powerful. That colonies in so many parts of the world, they were even ruling India. But the Sultan writes a letter at that time, even though it's towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, yet they are afraid. And today, we hardly see 
any Muslim leader speaking, just one, two, three or yes, a few here and there. But they are speaking individually. Imagine if all the Muslim leaders in the world, even half of them, get together and give a warning. There will be a world of a difference. Today, the Muslim leaders are more involved. Will it benefit me? Will it not benefit me? Will I remain in power? Will I not remain in power? They are more bothered about their seat here. They are not bothered about the Akhirah at all. Imagine, our beloved Prophet said, anyone who does not love Allah and his Messenger more than he loves himself, loves his father, loves his children, he is not a moment. How can we Muslims keep quiet when someone is blaspheming against a Prophet? What has happened to the Muslim Ummah? That's the reason when I gave my action, the lower actions are mainly for the common man. And I personally believe that see this example that the Muslims are united. What an example. Even though towards the end, I personally believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all these actions that take place, whether it be Salman Rajdi, whether it be Danish cartoon, whether it be the Charlie Hebdo, whether it be the statement made by President Macron, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing the Muslims. Do you think Allah cannot solve the problem? Very easily for Allah. Kun kun very easy. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 61, anyone who abuses the messenger of Allah, for him there is a painful punishment. Allah repeats a similar message in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 57. Indeed, those who abuse Allah and his messenger, Allah curses them in this world and the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him to solve this is very easy. What is he doing? He is checking the iman of the believers. Iman of the Muslims. I believe all these incidences is taking place. Allah wants to check who is the true believer, who is the namesake believer, who is the munafik. There may be Muslims who may be praying, but they may be munafik. They may be calling themselves Muslims, but they're joining hands with the enemies of Islam. So I believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these incidents are taking place to check what are you doing. You cannot complain, okay, that Muslim leader is not good. Allah will ask, what did you do? Allah will ask each and every Muslim, what did you do when you heard that some was someone was making a caricature of the Prophet, peace be upon him? What did you do when someone insulted a Prophet? And everyone will be responsible. For, everyone will be responsible for himself. That's the reason in my 12 action, what I mentioned, each one depending upon what capacity Allah has given you. You cannot say, okay, I am a layman. What difference does it make? Okay, at least inform one person. Whatever you have, Allah will check on your capacity. As I said earlier, if Allah has given you a capacity to reach a million people, and if you reach half a million people, compared to another person who Allah has given capacity to reach 100 people and he reaches all 100 people, he will get more sawab than the person who has reached half a million because Allah had given him 1 million capacity. That's what keeps me striving. What Allah has given ni'amah to me, am I doing my job or not? Am I fulfilling my duty as a Muslim or not? Am I taking correct action or not? Am I doing enough or not? You cannot say, okay, I am, what different does it make? I am a normal Muslim, I don't have contacts, what different does it make? Whatever Allah will not see on the results, Allah will see on how much jihad you do, how much striving you do, how much struggle you do. So based on whatever capacity you have, whatever ability Allah has given you, whether writing ability, whether Allah has given you speaking ability, whether whatever contacts Allah has given you, whether you may be having 100 people on your Facebook, or a thousand people, or a million people, or 20 million people, Allah will check how much effort have you taken. If Allah has given you a popularity, it is Allah has given you. We are nothing. Are we utilizing it for the cause of Islam or not? 
the more ability Allah gives you, the more facility Allah gives you, more will you be responsible. So I believe personally, all these things that are happening in the world, Allah is testing us believers. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, Allah will surely test you with fear and hunger, with loss of life and goods. You can never enter Jannah without being tested. So this is the time that we are being tested. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts. And may He guide us in the right way to react to such things that are taking place in the world. YouTube is not as much. YouTube is not working yet. <coughs> we are on the Facebook. The message was long and I knew, even though I tried to make it short, it was long. We have many people on the Facebook. Masood Wahaj. Jepi Khan, Kamal Hussain, Abdurrahman Avi, Karafa Konate, Ahmed Umar Usman, Chaudhry Iqbal, Ghazala Ansari Shafiq, Mustafa Gandor, Abdul Mabud, Muhammad Asif, Ayar Rahman, Muhammad Naimul Islam, Umar Hassan, Ishaq Shobar Hashim, Muhammad Yusuf, Zinat Hussain, Yusuf Karsi, Yasin Afasi Yasin, Masood Wahaj. All of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. They are doing duas. May Allah accept your duas. May Allah bless you too. We have um, on the YouTube Shabnam Parveen, Arshad M, Kamal Rifa, Selina Akhtar, Humira Yasmin, Muhammad Masoom Ali, Hanifa Haya, Arshad M, Kamal Rifa. Huzaifa Mansoor The first question that has come on the WhatsApp Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. I am Abdul Lahi Abdul Rahman. Abdul Ilahi Abdul Rahman from Mogadishu, Somalia. I am an accounting finalist at Mogadishu University and at the same time teaching the Quran at Al Bashair Kindergarten. We Somalis follow your lectures and we adore them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard you, Sheikh. Jazakallah shukran. Students at the university who do not pay tuition fee on the due date are fined with extra money or late fee. Is that money interest and is it haram? 
the question posed by the brother from Somalia is that if we do not pay the tuition fees, whether of a university or of a school or of a college on time, and if a late fee is charged, additional money is charged, is it interest? Is it haram or is it permissible? I'm aware that most of the universities and schools and college, if you don't be on time, they take a late fee. And unfortunately, even most of the Muslim university, Muslim schools and Muslim colleges, when you don't pay the fees on time, there is a late fee involved. As far as charging late fee, additional money, more than the tuition fee that is there, if a person gives it late, it is nothing but riba. Charging money extra because you give late, it is riba and it's totally haram. You cannot take late fee just because a person hasn't paid on time. It is not permitted and it is haram. You can take a late fee or a penalty if someone is giving some services. For example, there's a builder who said, I will finish the construction of this building on so and so date. And if he delays and there is a loss and if in the contract it is mentioned in advance, that if you don't complete the project on time, there will be a late fee, so and so, that is permissible. Because that is because they did not fulfill his commitment. But charging money on extra money, charging money on the money you did not pay. For example, someone takes a loan and if he doesn't repay on time, charging extra money, it is riba. For example, you are giving your payment in installments and if there is a delay, and if you have to pay extra money, this is nothing but riba and it is prohibited. So money on money for delayed payment, charging extra money is haram. If certain services are not given on time, whether building construction, whether project is not complete, that is permitted if it's mentioned in contract in advance. However, there are some scholars who have permitted for the Islamic banks that if the person doesn't give on time, then initially we have to give him more time but if he keeps on continuing and keeps on extending and keeps on taking exorbitant time then the scholars they say that they can be a fine levied but the Islamic institution, the Islamic bank cannot utilize that money. If there is exorbitant delay after giving the initial extra time and yet if they keep on delaying then a fine can be levied but this fine should 100% go in charity. That means because asking extra money is prohibited, it is acts like a deterrent. This fine is more of a deterrent rather than that Islamic bank benefiting. The Islamic bank does not benefit that complete money they have to give to a charitable cause to some other charity for a noble cause. They cannot utilize that money. But regarding your main question, charging extra fee if the tuition fee is late, it's not permitted. If you feel he hasn't paid on time, give him a warning. You can ask him not to come to school or not to come to university or not to come to college. That is permitted. But charging extra money is not permitted. It is nothing but riba. Hope that answers the question. The next question. My name is Suleiman Adin from Kenya. What is the ruling of Islam when a child is born? Is it a must to recite Adhan into his ear? The question poses that what is the ruling that after a child is born? Is it a must to recite Adhan in his ear? No scholar has ever said it is a must to recite the Adhan in the ear of the child. But as far as should Adhan be recited? Is it a Sunnah or not? There, there is a difference of opinion. There is a Hadith which is there in Sunan Abu Dawud, word number 5, Hadith number 5105, where Ubaidur Rahman Ibn Ari 
men la bipliz vetim. Ubeid uh, Rahman Ibn Rafi, men la bipliz vetim. He narrates that his father said that he saw the Prophet giving adhan in the year of Hassan ibn Ali, the son of Fatima or the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But this hadith of Abu Dawud, most of the Muhammad say it is daif. There is another hadith in Tirmidhi, in Sunan at Tirmidhi, volume number 3, hadith number 1514 where it says that Ubaidur Rahman Ibn Rafi may Allah be pleased with him he said that his father said that he saw the Prophet peace be upon him giving Adhan in the year of Hassan bin Ali who was the son of Fatima the daughter of Prophet Muhammad now this hadith of Tirmidhi the difference of opinion some of the scholars say the hadith is zaif some say because of corroborative along with corroborating with the other hadith this hadith becomes hasan it becomes accepted it becomes sahih so as far as the hadith of sunan at tirmidhi volume 5 hadith number 1514 is concerned the difference of opinion amongst the muhaddisin whether this hadith is accepted or not. Some say it is daif, some say it is hasan, is accepted. According to Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, he says that even along with the other hadith, even corroborating with the other hadith, even the other hadith are weak, so this hadith is daif and should not be acted upon. According to Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh bin Baz says, that it is mustahab to give adhan in the year of a newborn but the other had the one more hadith which says that you should give akama in the left ear of the newborn this is daif all the scholars man all the scholars unanimously agree that giving akama is a daif hadith and should not be done but the difference of opinion regarding giving azan. Some say should give, some say should not give. According to Ibn Qayyum, may Allah have mercy on him, was a student of uh, Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah. He says that though this is a zaif hadith, there are many benefits and that is the reason azan should be given in the year of a newborn. He says that the first words that the newborn will hear is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Tawheed, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. It is beneficial. So according to Ibn Qayyum, may Allah have mercy on him, he says it is mustab, it should be given, according to Bin Baaz, it should be given, according to Asun al-Bani, it should not be given, the difference of opinion as far as Adhan to be given in the year of a newborn. The next question, my name is Sayyid Bayazid Islam, I am from Bangladesh, is boxing or MMA, mixed martial arts fightings, income halal in Islam? A similar question is asked, my name is Amar Nazir Ahmed from India, I am a big fan of your work sir. I want to ask you whether if MMA, mixed martial arts, is haram, as you know our Muslim brother Khabib is famous in it. He is an inspirational fighter. Can you please guide all our Muslim brothers and me whether to join this sports or not? The basic question posed is that is boxing permitted? Is mixed martial arts MMA permitted? Can we take part in, in these sports, in this competition? As far as boxing is concerned, before I give the opinion 
of the Muslim scholars. As far as boxing is concerned, there are many non-Muslims who are against this sport. And they say this is not a sport at all because it harms the human being. There are many non-Muslim organizations which have objected and have asked that this boxing should be removed from the international sports. It is not a sport at all. As far as Islam is concerned, any sport which is beneficial for the human being, which, which helps the human being and has got no harm, it should be done. But if the sport is not beneficial and is harmful for the, for the human body, then you should abstain from it. So these non-Muslim organizations, they have filed petitions in many countries. Unfortunately, most of the countries have disagreed, except Sweden. Sweden is the only country which has agreed to ban boxing as a sport. If you read the Huna magazine, which published from London, they say in the magazine that from 1945 to 1983, in a span of 38 years, 350 boxers have died because of injuries during the boxing match. And there are tens of thousands who have been injured. So based on this, they want to ban this sport because it is harmful for the human being. As far as the Islamic ruling is concerned, we know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when two of the Sahabas were wrestling, he said that do not hit on the face. The Prophet prohibited from hitting on the face. We also know that when the lady who was given the punishment of stoning to death because of adultery, the Prophet said, do not stone her face. Imagine when there is a hath penalty given, when a person has adultery and this punishment given, even at that time the Prophet said that do not hit at the face. So in Islam, hitting at the face or injuring the face is not permitted. So based on this, if you compare and see in boxing, in boxing, you get points, especially when there's a boxing match. And you get more points if you hit at the face. The maximum point that you get is hitting at the face. And the best match you can win is with a knockout punch. That means the more you harm the opponent, the more points you get. This is again the concept of Islam. Based on this, according to, according to Imam An-Nawi, he says that this sport it should not be permitted, it's not Islamic. Because you're harming the body, you're hitting on the face. Based on that, this face, this sport is not permitted. So based on this hadith of not to harm the face, not to harm the human body, most of the scholars, they say that boxing and any type of martial art which causes injury to the human being, in which it involves hitting of the face, an injury of the human being, it is not permitted. However, there are some scholars who say that if you are learning boxing or some martial arts for self-defense without involving in competition, because in competition, you have to attack your opponent, you have to hit him, you have to beat him, otherwise you cannot win. So they say that if you train yourself in boxing or martial arts only for self-defense, or only for health reason or also being prepared for jihad etc but it doesn't involve in competition where you have to hit the other person in this case it is permitted this is said only by some scholars but the majority scholars says involving in boxing as well as martial arts where there is injury to the human body and attacking the other person it is prohibited The next question, I am Roshni from Mauritius. I am a Hindu woman. I know that Allah is one God and I secretly pray and keep my fast. That is Rosa in Ramzan. My family doesn't know about this and it will be a problem for me if they come to know. 
I don't know what to do. I also have to participate in the Hindu prayer and I know it's a sin. On this situation, what is your advice and suggestion for me? Sister Roshni from Mauritius, she says that uh, she's a Hindu woman and she believes that God is one and she agrees in the teachings of Islam. She also falls during the month of Ramadan. But now her family members don't know about it. And many a times she may have to get involved in the Hindu worship, which she knows is a sin. What should she do? Sister, I understand from your question that you are an adult woman, but I'm not aware whether you're married or you're not married. And if you're not married, my advice to you would be that you should tell your family members, your parents, that you, what you believe in. You should meet them and with hikmah convey the message to them. Maybe you can see my videotapes on similarities between Islam and Hinduism and maybe point out from the Hindu scriptures initially that doing idol worship is wrong, what they are doing is wrong and try and break the news slowly. That idol worship is wrong, doing murti puja is wrong. You can convey to them also the message about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures and you can also mention to them about the other teachings. So whatever similarities that are there in my talk, alcohol is prohibited, pork is prohibited, mentioned in Hindu scriptures and Islam. If you convey to them slowly, slowly, they will start getting a hint, inshallah. And then maybe tell them that you believe there's one God and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God and convey to them there are two options that will take place. Maybe initially, surely they may get angry, but later on they may get pacified and they may agree with what you have done. They may not agree, but at least they will compromise with what you have done. Or maybe they'll get convinced with what you have said and they may accept Islam also. You have to convey with hikmah. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Udu ila rab Udu ila sabi li hikmah wal mu'azid al hasna wajadun bil hasan Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious. So slowly and steadily you can convey to them the message of Islam. There may be a very harsh reaction. They may get very angry. They may ask you to leave the house. You should be prepared. In this case, you can very well contact in advance before conveying the message to your family. You can contact maybe your Muslim friends who you have and inform them that you're going to inform your parents. And if in the worst case scenario, they ask you to leave, you can surely take the help of your Muslim friend and maybe stay with her for some time. And my advice to you would be that see for a good, if you have to leave the house, then see to it that you get married to a good, good practicing Muslim man so that you can lead a life where you can practice Islam. You ask the question that can you do the Hindu worship? You know it's a sin. You know very well it's a sin. Therefore, doing the Hindu worship is wrong. That's the reason you should convey to your family members as soon as possible that you like Islam and you're going to accept Islam. And I believe you have already accepted Islam. And convey to them, irrespective whether they allow you to stay in the house or not, it's your duty as a daughter that you should convey the message to your parents. If they allow you to stay, you continue staying, convey the message and then get married to a good Muslim boy. If they ask you to leave, see to it that you keep in touch with your parents. Don't at all get angry with them. Once you accept Islam, see to it that you behave like a better daughter than what you were before. Only those things what they tell you, which is against Quran and Sunnah, that you avoid. Those things what they tell you, which is against the teaching of the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad you avoid doing. All the rest you do. If they tell you, for example, to wear a blue color dress and you don't like blue color, wearing blue color out in Islam, see to it that you, wear, you start wearing a blue color dress. See to it that you love your mother and father more. You take care of them more. 
if you go out and if you start earning, say, see to it that you give some part of your earnings to your parents. You love them more. You are the one who can make their heart soft. And you are the one who can convey the message of Islam. And see to it that you deliver the message of Islam so that they too, your family members, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, they too, uh, they too accept Islam. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make your task easy, to convey the message. And may he soften the hearts of your parents and your family members so that they too come to the fold of Islam. This was the last question that I could answer. And we have run short of time. And inshallah, we'll meet next Saturday, maybe five minutes early, at 5.55 Makkah time, 2.55 GMT time, for the program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Till then, Assalamu alaikum, wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.